All right, so in this video, we're going to start our long process of talking about the Industrial Revolution. And we're going to talk in this video about the shift to capitalism. So why did we shift away from mercantilism to capitalism? And we're going to talk about a form of I guess we would call it proto-industrialization. So before we actually industrialized, proto-industrialization, before we industrialized, how did we kind of do factory labor without factory tools? So we'll talk about both of these topics in this video here. So. First thing we should do, define our terms. What is capitalism? So for our purposes, we're going to define it in terms of what mercantilism was. So mercantilism is an economic system in which the means of production, and this is going to be a term that we play around with a lot when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, the means of production. The means of production are basically the the tools or the facilities to make stuff, the means of production. So how do you make stuff, the means of production? The different economic systems that we talk about, like mercantilism, capitalism, eventually we'll talk about socialism, they're all about who owns and benefits from the means of production. In a mercantilist system, the means of production and the profits belong to the monarch. And they, the monarch, gives people the right to use them. But all of the benefits belong to the monarch. Capitalism, on the other hand, is a system in which the means of production and the profits belong to private individuals. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the monarch can't own stuff, but it's not just the monarch. So private individuals. Additionally, in a purely capitalist economy, there would be no restrictions on how you would make profits. Which is kind of why 
when we look at the early parts of industrialization, why that period is so uh, dirty and dangerous and toxic because there were no restrictions on how you made profits. It didn't matter if you hurt people, if you polluted every waterway, if you polluted the air, it didn't matter because all that mattered was that you made a profit. Now, eventually, there will be restrictions on these things. Restrictions will be placed on capitalism, but we'll worry about that when we start talking about the political effects of the Industrial Revolution, and that'll be a little bit down the road. So eventually we'll see some restrictions, but the, the idea of capitalism is private individuals own the means of production, the stuff that makes stuff, and they get to have the profits. And so they're gonna do whatever they can to make as much money on their investments. Okay, so why do we shift away from mercantilism and to capitalism? So we're going to come at this from two different points of view. So the first one is kind of a relic of the mercantilist system. So most of what we're going to be looking here is British because the British are the ones who are kind of spearheading this stuff. So most of this is happening from a British point of view and that's where we're going to be looking at. So the under mercantilism Mercantilism argues that state-run monopolies are good for trade. And so most of the major European powers had these state-run monopolies. I mean, we had the Dutch East India Company. We also have the one that we're going to talk about, the British East India Company. And I'm going to abbreviate that BEIC just because it's easier to write. These are good for trade. And the British East India Company controlled all the trade with India. In fact, they pretty much controlled India completely. I guess, for all intents and purposes. So the British East India Company controlled all of the trade with India, and really they were in charge of India. They ruled through Indian intermediaries, but the British East India Company was really the the power in India. So this started in 1600 
Elizabeth gave them the charter, which is basically the right to do what they're doing. So Elizabeth gave them the charter, and starting in 1754, we get a period of what's called company rule, where the British East India Company is basically running India. And at this point, the British East India Company starts to alter India's economy to benefit the British. So a couple of things start to happen. Parliament bans the import of Indian fabric or Indian textiles because they were thought of to be, they were a rival of British made textiles. So Parliament says we're not going to import any Indian textiles because we want to protect British made textiles. So we want to protect our textiles. But they didn't say anything about Indian cotton. They said nothing about Indian cotton. So what ends up happening is that the British East India Company shifts India's economy to produce raw cotton for export. And all of that raw cotton is being exported to the UK. One of the reasons they did this was because the American colonies were, we'll say, iffy about supplying the UK with cotton. I mean, we're talking about the 1750s here. It's not going to be too much longer until the American colonies declare independence and then fight the Revolutionary War and break away. So really the British are hedging their bets. They want to keep their supply of cotton coming. Now, unbeknownst to the British at this point, the Americans keep producing cotton. Even after the Revolutionary War. They keep producing cotton after the Revolutionary War and they keep supplying, they just trade with the British. Remember, that was why the, the French were so upset at the end of the Revolutionary War, because they figured that all of that American stuff would be now traded with the French. But the Americans kind of double-crossed the French and signed this trade deal with the British. So now the British have this 
just huge amount of raw cotton they have to deal with. And so when we think about industrialization, industrialization was an attempt, a successful attempt, to quickly process all this raw cotton. And we're going to think about this in terms of capitalism because investors will, I guess, fund these new inventions inventions and these guys will make lots of money so if you had some money you could get in on the ground floor of the industrial revolution if you funded somebody making one of these inventions and this is all outside of the mercantilist international trade system. Mercantilism doesn't, mercantilism would actually love this. Use what you have at home to make money. And this is going to supplant mercantilism. This is going to be so much more successful than mercantilism ever was. And that brings us to the other side of this, which is more of a philosophical argument. So this argument is all, or this side of the shift is all economic. The British needed to ensure their supply of cotton. They weren't sure about the American supply, so they made sure that the Indians would provide them with cotton. And it turned out that they ended up with double the amount of cotton than they actually needed. And so necessity being the mother of invention, the British invented a bunch of ways to quickly process the raw cotton. And the people who funded those inventions made a lot of money, and they own their own means of production. And it replaces mercantilism. The other side of this is a philosophical argument. Economic philosophers most notably Adam Smith argue that mercantilism and the monopolies that they promote stifle economic production instead of benefiting And so what we want, we want competition. Competition drives down prices and it increases the quality of production. Monopolies don't really care about quality and they can charge whatever they want. You want competition because consumers want low prices and high quality. So you want to get rid of monopolies and you want competition. Now, here's where we start to see a difference between those who are in power and those who have the money. 
those who are in power, and remember, we're still thinking about this from a British point of view, those who are in power are still in favor of trade restrictions and these monopolies. Why? Because they benefit from them. Because they're landowners. They're landowners and they own interests in colonial holdings. They don't want anything to change. The system is meant to benefit those people in power. And one of the best examples of this are the Corn Laws. These were in place in 1815 through 1846. These were laws restricting the import of foreign grain. So in British English, corn referred to any kind of grain, wheat, barley, corn, whatever, it referred to grain. These benefited the landowners who were also the members of parliament. So these are the same guys. The landowners and the members of parliament are the same people. These guys are opposed by the new capitalist class. These guys are rich, but don't own land, which meant they couldn't be a member of parliament. So eventually, these rich guys are going to start opposing the landed elite, the people who own the land. And that's the other way that capitalism starts to become popular, at least in Great Britain. Because if you've got money, you've got power. Remember, Money equals power. So the last thing I want to turn to here, and we'll only spend a minute on this, is this idea of proto-industrialism. Basically, how do we do factory work before factories. That's the question. How do we do factory work before factories? So we've got all this cotton. What to do with the cotton. Basically, what ended up happening was that we used a system called the putting out system. Sometimes it's also known as cottage industry. And it's very simple. Rich guys imported cotton they took it out to the country 
They took it out to villages and gave it to families. with the equipment to make yarn or to make fabric. And then at the end of the week, the rich guy came back and picked up the finished products. And paid the family. Now you could make a pretty decent enough living by doing this. You would spend all week turning raw cotton into thread, which is what the yarn is, or if you were, if you had a loom at home, you could turn the thread into fabric and then the man would come back and pay for what you've done. Now, this eventually is going to be replaced by actual factories that will do this on a much larger scale and can do it much faster than a person can because a factory can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this is gonna eventually be replaced by actual factories and giant machines, but it's also gonna linger on in, I guess, smaller endeavors like uh, tailoring, like something that requires an actual person to make alterations to something. It's also going to be used for things that, that require more specialized tools like uh, making locks or guns and it's going to linger on in these smaller endeavors kind of into maybe the early 20th century when again these things will be replaced by machines that can do these kinds of tools uh, so that's how we shifted from mercantilism to capitalism. Basically, capitalism just makes more money for more people, and that's going to replace something that only makes money for the monarch. So in our next video, we're actually going to start looking at industrialization, so the process by which the British started to industrialize. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.